that very fast on the GPU. So if you have code that uses exponentials, the GPU is going to do very well for you. Um, and this is why you are seeing these speed ups in the 100 range. It's because we have exponentials in there. If, if I took this out and it was a multiply, the relative speed difference between the CPU and the GPU, would, would that gap would be brought much closer. So, so what are the what are the math uh, uh, functions? That like square root is also hardware instruction, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have reciprocal square root. They have square root. They have uh, reciprocal. They have your normal arithmetic instructions. They have hardware trigonometric routines, so sine, cosine. Sine. Signposts, which where you calculate both of them at once, um, and I think if you look in the CUDA programming guide, the easiest way to determine that is they list a bunch of reduced precision fast routines. Those fast math routines, every one of those routines corresponds to a GPU machine instruction of some kind, and so that's that's the easy way of getting the list. OpenCL has a similar thing. Um, so OpenCL has what they call native math routines. So any OpenCL routine that begins with native underscore is the machine instruction version of that math library routine. You can, uh, this is another thing, you can use a more precise version of exponents or, or whatever other routines you want to call. They will run slower uh, to give you better accuracy. In our case, just like with the uh, potential calculations, our main area where we lose accuracy is when we add these things together. It isn't so much the exponentials or the other terms themselves that are uh, sensitive precision-wise. It's when we add thousands and thousands of these together that we're getting floating point truncation. So if we wanted to improve the accuracy of our code, probably what we would do is we would uh, change the code that actually accumulates these numbers together. And that we, we would use double precision or something there first. And then, if and only if we need more precision, would we start percolating uh, higher precision variables and, and functions up through the rest of the code? So basically, once we've uh, computed, this is an interesting point here. This loop is very costly to the GPU in other ways, though. Although the exponentials are very fast, the GPU is nowhere near as good at, at running through loops as CPUs are. And one of the things that's worth noting is, in a lot of cases, the number of different atom species and uh, the number of coefficient arrays and things that have to be walked, although it's non, you know, it's it's greater than one. It's usually a small number. Maybe it's only six or seven or eight, or maybe twelve. The, that, in the grand scheme of things, is a very short loop. And so the fraction of time spent processing this uh, loop logic versus the fraction of time spent doing the body of the loop is unusually high for the GPU. The, the overhead is considerable. And so one way we can make this code much faster would be to unroll these loops or uh, do some tricks with the compiler, which I will describe a little later. This uh, loop here, we can actually, since we have a fixed number of different types of angular momenta, that's these different S orbital, uh, P orbital, D orbital, you know, FG, etc. All those different uh, orbital types have a different uh, scheme of how this loop function is on, it ends up being evaluated. Because we have a fixed range of these that we figure we'll ever encounter in a real simulation, up to about G, I think is typical for most quantum chemistry codes, um, we can actually hand code these things. So rather than evaluating these as a loop, like we have shown in this simple example, in the real code, we won't do it with a loop at all. We'll have a switch statement and say, well, what kind of orbital is it, or shell type is it? And then we will actually jump to a block of code that is exactly written for that or, uh, shell type. So if it's an S uh, or a P or a D, it just jumps straight into the right block of code for that type. And there is no loop overhead at all. It just runs a, a, a completely unrolled sequence of arithmetic instructions and then does the math. And so we have all these nested loops. The GPU does a great job at doing these costly special functions, but its weakness is processing all the loops themselves and all of the indexing arithmetic. This is stuff that the GPU is not as skilled at as a CPU is. So 
One way we can make this run fast on the GPU is in many of these quantum chemistry simulations, if we do this sorting and, and pre-processing to eliminate duplicate coefficients and things like this, we can effectively compress down the data sets to a size where they can fit entirely in the 64K constant memory. On the old GPUs, this was the fastest way we had found to do this calculation. And so if we can fit all those coefficient arrays in constant memory, every thread is computing its own uh, orbital amplitude at its own position because these are all distance dependent uh, functions, right? So they have their own uh, distance from their own atoms that they're calculating and then they sum up all those different equations and they get a different answer. Uh, but they are reading the same arrays of shells and uh, angular momenta and uh, orbital contraction coefficients, all those different things. And so all of that data that's common to all the workers can be in constant memory. And because they're all accessing the same element at the same time, they get uh, performance that's nearly the same as if it were in a register. So that's another way we're, we're tremendously amplifying the bandwidth. So rather than doing this calculation, zipping through those arrays at the speed of global memory, which at best is about 150 gigabytes a second, we're closer to a terabyte a second or more because we're coming out of this near register speed cache. So the angular momenta loops that I was describing, instead of actually processing those with a loop here, we have a switch statement. You can see we have a case for an S shell, D shell, and so on, a P shell, and, and so on. And, and these then are unrolled loops. This would have been a loop that evaluated each one of these lines of code. But since we know a priori how that's going to work out, we can make special blocks of code for every one of those cases. And the only trade-off we have uh, that's worth noting here is, well, you know, the, uh, there are a lot of these common uh, components of these expressions. So we have uh, the x, uh, sort of the delta x squared, delta y squared, delta z squared. As we go to the higher orbital uh, types, there are much longer equations. So they have cubed components and so on and different combinations of uh, terms that are common with some of the preceding ones. One of the trade-offs we make is, well, how many of these different uh, terms do we compute up front and attempt to reuse? So these, actually, the squared components, we calculate those way up at the beginning of the kernel, and we hold on to them because we basically assume we'll definitely use the squared terms. But the cube terms, you know, that if we, we pre-compute those, they consume registers, and especially if we do all of the different uh, combinations of pairings will balloon our register usage tremendously. And although that would save us arithmetic, if we increase our register usage too much, it'll actually slow down the kernel. So there's a little bit of a trade-off. Well, how, many, how much of this arithmetic do we sort of pre-compute and reuse over and over versus how much do we compute as we go? And so that's one of the trade-offs we're making here. And so this basically got rid of all the loop overhead for these short runs. So these would have been uh, calculations where the loop overhead was considerable because you can see there's basically two floating point operations, an increment of an uh, integer index register, and uh, uh, a read of a coefficient for each one of these lines of code. That's not very much versus the loop overhead, the test, the branch, and GPUs don't have branch prediction hardware, so those loops are costly. So anything we can do to get rid of loops for small calculations like this is a very good idea. Um, so I described that we, uh, we do all this pre-processing and sorting. The other thing that we do is we pad out all of the arrays that we're going to access to guarantee that they're coalesced for anything that we read in and out of global memory. And then it makes it simpler for us to have arbitrary thread block sizes and we don't have to have any branching inside of our code to say, well, is our thread beyond the end of some array? We don't have to worry about that then and it makes it a lot easier to write the code for. So, <coughs> of the data that we load at the very beginning, the, the one thing that is constant for all time is the basis set. And the basis set are the coefficients that control this loop right here. Once we know that basis set, if unfortunately, we, generally speaking, we don't know what ba basis set 
that quantum chemistry simulation used. But if we did know, we could actually get rid of this loop in much the same way that we did for this one. So this is an opportunity, if we know that base is set and we're able to generate a, a custom kernel on the fly, and I'll tell you how to do that in a little bit, we could get rid of the loop and do the same trick we did here, where there's just straight arithmetic and, and memory references, and there's no loop overhead at all. So that's an interesting thing to note. So that's an opportunity for tremendous optimization. We could get about 40 to 70 percent performance improvement by getting rid of the data-driven loops and changing that to completely <coughs> predetermined code. The wave function arrays are different at every time step, but the beauty about the wave function arrays is they're only changing these values. So the equation that we're computing with that wave function data is exactly the same from one time step to the next. The only thing that's different are the actual uh, magnitudes of those numbers, the actual numbers themselves that are in those arrays. They're different, but the calculation that we're doing with it is exactly the same. And so when we work through those calculations, we're walking through memory and strictly consecutive uh, memory accesses. In the case of the basis set, we're either walking to the next element or we're using the same one the next time through. So it just depends on the, what the basis set contains. For, and for the wave function data, we are always walking through memory one cell to the next in a strictly consecutive order. And so the good thing to notice about this in terms of the modern GPU hardware, uh, now that Fermi has L1 caches, this kind of con consecutive memory access pattern is perfect for a cache. So it's good not only for the GPU, but also for CPUs, and particularly for Fermi. This means that for Fermi, we could get rid of that code that, uh, that put everything in constant memory, and we could just put it in global memory, and because we have a friendly access pattern, it will have nearly the same performance. And the kernel is about half the amount of code, and it's much easier to read, so that's great. Um, and so, the way we've implemented this code for these multiple generations of GPUs, if we're not running on a Fermi, and the total size of the data set is less than 64K, we put all of it in constant memory, and then we broadcast that data to all the threads, and then we get our many terabytes of effective memory bandwidth. Uh, if we have a data set size that's much larger than can fit in that constant memory, then we have to take a different strategy, and we instead uh, use shared memory as sort of a program-managed cache. Now, as you saw, we have several different arrays that we're loading, and they have different sizes. And the sizes and strides and things like this are not known at the time we build the code. So all of those things become variables. And so we have to sort of juggle references to these different arrays as the code is running. And I'll show you how this works. So the, the issue then is we have these multiple arrays that have different lengths. And we want to load tiles from global memory right before we go into those tight little calculation loops because we don't want to have to check, do we have that data? Do we have that data? Do the, we want to minimize the amount of time we spend checking to see if we have the data and maximize the amount of time that we're running in those tight loops. And so if we, if we do this with shared memory with a, a good algorithm, we can get performance that's within 27% of the hardware caching that uh, GT200 has. Uh, and then for me, of course, we have a one cache. So uh, for the shared memory implementation, what we're basically doing, we have all of our data is in global memory. At any given part or step of the calculation, we are going to enter